Hey everybody, Matt here again. Thanks for, thanks for tuning in and watching this video today. We're gonna look at why, why some people seem to just explode over almost nothing, why some people are stuck in just a deep discontent with who they are. We're gonna look at unlocking the reality of our identity and breaking free from just those horrible negative self images that pull us down. I'm so happy you joined us. It's gonna be a great video. Why do we see those dynamic videos of fights at the Little League? Parents going crazy? You go to a basketball game, the power of the ref's whistle to solicit aggravation and frustration from a parent because they don't like the way the referee is calling the shots for their kid or even their kid's team. Why? It's not about the bad call. It's that there's a tie in to their identity. They want to win and they want to be treated fairly. You know, everybody is heavily invested in their own identity. And many times we get our identity from all the wrong things. Some it's jockeying within the family and their position in the hierarchy of the family. I mean, they call the shots for the holidays, they decide what people should or shouldn't do, and they're kind of a powerhouse in their own family and in their broader family, they affect others. For some, they, they get their identity not in their family, but in their career. I mean, just ask them and immediately off their tongue rolls the title of the job that they hold. Well, I'm a doctor, I'm a technician, I'm a lawyer, I'm this, I'm a senior agent. I, all these different titles come rolling in and you know immediately that they're positioning their life and they're building their identity around the trappings given to them through their career. Some it's through their own educational achievement. Well, I, I hold these certifications or I have a, a master's degree or, or I have a doctorate degree. Some, I have a PhD and, and their degree will be a big piece that they've heavily invested in for their own identity. Some will even do the same thing. This doesn't end at the doors of the church. Some even take the title in the Lord's work and they use that to, to build their, their emotional identity and somehow feed their ego in a level of superiority. Some will say, well, I'm a deacon here. Or, oh, we've been in this church how many years? As if that means they're higher up. They're at a different level than somebody else. And all these pinnings, all of these thoughts, work in to create our self-image. But yet we live in a world where most people are walking around, their shoulders are slumped down, they're staring at the ground, they're looking at their phone, and they're envious of people they see online who somehow have sailed higher and faster and farther and greater than they have in their life, and they sport a negative a derogatory self-image. How do we break free from that? I want you to look with me in the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 23 and verse 8. Jesus is talking here and he says there's a moment in time and he condemns those who, who love to be lifted up. They love to get the better seats at the weddings, at the feast. They love the salutations of superiority that they got out about in the marketplace. And Jesus says to, the, to them in Matthew 23 and verse 8, 
but be not ye called rabbi. For one is your master, even Christ, and ye are all brethren. The titles that we grab, that society works to earn to have, don't worry about that, Jesus said. Don't, don't be called that. Don't, don't let your credentials, don't let your job, don't let your positions change your name for who you are. Remember, one is your master, Christ, and your brethren. You know, when we begin to hone the focus of our life away from all the positioning and all the emotional investment that we put in our identity to label ourselves as some level of success where we're all failing at and therefore we're not satisfied with that level of success, when we break away from that and we look at the truth that Jesus shared, we realize there is one master. One master. One master, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In John chapter 4, Jesus was waiting outside of the city. His disciples went in to gather the food and bring it back to him. And Jesus is waiting at a well, knowing with the knowledge of God, knowing with the superior understanding of the all-knowing God, having foreknowledge and understanding beyond our comprehension. Jesus is waiting for a woman of Samaria to come out to the well. And when she comes to the well, Jesus talks to her. And she's startled immediately that Jesus talks to her because she says right off the bat, how is it that you, Jesus, being a Jew, talk to me, a Samaritan? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. The Jews position themselves as better than the Samaritans, and they look down on the Samaritans. And Jesus talked with her and said, I... I talk to you because I offer you the water of eternal life. This well where you come and draw up the water and you carry it in and you use it for your things, it keeps running out and you keep coming back for more. I give you a well of eternal life that will flow out of you whereby you'll never thirst again. That woman who listened to the words of Jesus and received Jesus as her Savior, she would leave that well and leave her water pot behind, run back into the city and say, come and see a man. You know, until we see Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior, we'll never have a clear identity of who we are. We're all living condemned under sin, and we're offered so great a salvation in Jesus Christ if we'll receive Him as our Savior. Oh, when we receive Jesus Christ as our Savior, everything begins to change because we then have a new identity as a child of God. The Bible says that before we receive Jesus as our Savior, we're naturally born under sin, born under the curse and penalty of sin, and we're at enmity, we're at war with God, because we keep doing our way and God's drawing us to His perfect way. But when we receive Jesus Christ as our Savior, there is an adoption made and we move into the family of God, and we have one Master, Jesus Christ. There's one that we look up to. Don't worry about the titles people give you, Jesus said in Matthew 23, 8. Don't worry about being called rabbi or anything else. One is your master, even Christ. Oh, how great a salvation Jesus gives us in his holy name. Oh, if we're going to reorient and break away from that heavily invested identity that we've created as being who we are in our society, in our job, in our family, even in our church, we have to pull away and say, I'm not worried about what I get called. I have a master and his name is Jesus. But then, if we're going to break free, 
if we're really going to escape and pull out of these negative self images that come because our identity, our heavily invested identity is in our education, but somebody else gets more education. It's in our title, but somebody else gets a better title. It's in our, it's in our length of service, but somebody serves longer or better. It, it's in all these things and it kind of erodes. We've got to remember a truth of this life. Yeah, there's a truth in this life. Well, we orient off of our one master, Jesus Christ, might we be reminded that there are many outcomes? That's right, there's many outcomes. In James, the Bible said, you make an annual plan of how you're going to work in your city and in your surroundings, and you're going to gain and move ahead financially. And he said that's all very presumptive, very presumptive, because you ought to say, if the Lord wills and we live, we're going to do this or that. You see, the Bible tells us this truth from Ecclesiastes 9.11. Solomon, in the wisdom of God, writing the word of God, said this, I returned and saw under the sun, or on this earth, that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, Neither yet bread to the wise, nor riches to men of understanding, nor favor to men of skill. Listen to these final words. But time and chance happeneth to them all. Time and chance happens to them all. You won't always get the win that your talents deserve. You won't always reap the harvest that the sweat of your labor in the field put together to create. Things won't always go your way. There's many different outcomes. Might we remember when we're jealous of someone else or envious of what somebody else has or we feel like we've worked really hard and then been passed over. Time and chance happens to everybody. The Bible speaks of specifically, over and over again, an evil time. It even talks so much of the time being so evil that it's a bad time to give birth to a child. We believe children are the heritage of the Lord, the gift of God. Life is sacred from the moment of conception. But the Bible even says there's times on this earth that are just bad times. You know, in 1 Kings chapter 22, a king by the name of Jeho Jehoshaphat, he had some ships that he put together and he had a whole fleet of merchant going ships that were going to go out and go into the rest of the world and bring back gold. And the Bible says that all this fleet of ships that the king had, that they didn't sail, but rather they got broken up in a particular place where it was rocky and they sank to the bottom of the sea. I don't know why some things succeed and some things fail. Whether things move in your favor or don't move in your favor. But we must remember that time and chance happens to everybody. Quit looking down on yourself because of what happened in the times of your life. Just because it looks like someone else got a better chance doesn't mean the opportunity God's given you is nothing. Remember that grand song, Little is much. Little is much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it if you'll go in Jesus' name. Hey, there's going to be differing outcomes. Time and chance happens to everybody. Sometimes you're, you're going to go for it and seize the prize and win and come back with rejoicing. Other times it will be an evil time and you'll put in all the work and all the labor, but time and chance will have worked against it and you won't have the results that you would have gotten at another moment. That's why we have to be anchored in our one master. The first psalm describes it this way. 
that he brings forth his fruit in his season. There will be paying seasons. There will be seasons of fruitfulness in times when the branches are loaded with productive food. But there'll be times when seasons when the branches have nothing. But the Bible says that his leaf doesn't wither. What it means there is even though there's going to be times and chance when everything isn't happening the way you want it to, the reality of the life and that God is over your life and that your master Jesus Christ is with you no matter the outcome, that's inspiring. Hey, I don't have to. I don't have to let my head hang low. I don't have to fly off the handle the minute something doesn't roll in my favor because I know I have one master and that's Jesus. I know that there's many outcomes that time and chance happen to everybody. But then look with me at this third thing. We are all brethren. That's right, the third truth is that we are all brethren. Be not called rabbi. Don't, don't get caught up in all the titles and positions and everything that goes with that. One is your master Christ. And ye are all brethren. Yeah, we're all brethren. You know, in Christ Jesus, Galatians chapter 3, powerful piece of the Word of God. It says that in Christ Jesus, there's neither Jew nor Greek. There aren't those who are entitled to the promises of Abraham and those who aren't. No, the love of God extends to all. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. Those who are in debt, in slavery, in behind the eight ball, and those who are freely living their life and cashing in on the American dream. There's neither one because we're in Christ one. He goes as far as to say there's neither male nor female. But in Jesus, we're all one. We're all brethren. It's funny how we take the hierarchies of the world and we just tie them into the church and there's more important people and less important people and we miss the message of the towel. You know, the next time you wash your hands and you reach for a paper towel or, or a cloth towel and you dry your hands, pause and look at that towel and remember this truth, that there was a moment in time when Jesus Christ tied a towel around himself as an apron and got down on his knees and took a basin of water and he knelt before his disciples, the twelve apostles, and he took that towel and that basin of water and he began, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ began to wash their feet. Peter immediately sensing what was wrong with this picture. Jesus, the great one, the Messiah, the Christ of God, the one sent down from heaven, is washing feet. And Peter said, no, 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 this can't be the way it is. Not so, Lord. And Jesus said, what I do now, you don't fully understand. But I'm putting an example, I'm laying out an example for you to follow. If you call me Lord and I am your Lord, I'm the high and exalted one, and I am willing to do this lowly job of washing your feet, you ought to all do things like this one for the other. The message of the towel. Next time you dry your hands and you look at that towel, Think about the humility of our Lord, but think about the lesson that he leaves us. We're all brethren. In 1 Corinthians 12, the scripture says there's diversity of gifts. Some people's gifts are a way lot cooler looking sometimes than other people's gifts. But the same spirit. 
It says there's diversities of administrations. There's ways that they do things that are going to be diverse or, or very different. And some of them, if they're different, will be cooler and better. It says diversities of administration, but the same Lord. And there's diversity of operations, the way they operate, what they do. But the same God, which is in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man. In other words, all believers receive the Holy Spirit to be profited thereby. And even though there's diversity, as 1 Corinthians 12 talks about, he says, now are we the body of Christ and members in particular. And the hand can't say to the foot, I don't need you. The, the arm can't say to the leg, I don't need you. The parts of the body don't cast each other away as unnecessary. The Bible even says this, those parts of the body which are more feeble are necessary. Even if you feel like you're the most feeble piece in your entire church, God says you're necessary to fulfill the body of Christ. Hey, you know, we're, we're all brethren. We're together as one. Brethren in the family of God through Jesus Christ. Oh, there's the great rabbi. Come sit here. James says, don't, don't have the faith of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ with respective persons. Can we take our well-invested identities and, as the Bible says, casting down imaginations and high things that rise up against the knowledge of God? Oh, I thank God for your education. I'm, I'm proud of your PhD. I'm proud that you're a doctor. I'm proud that you went to law school and, and, and have a Juris Doctorate, that you're an attorney. I'm, I'm proud that you're an RN, that you are a certified nurse. I, I'm proud of all these things, these certifications, these educations, these learnings. That's all well. They are tools in your arsenal that God has given you to go through this life and be profitable and to accomplish accomplish more for his kingdom and his glory, but to let those things turn around and slap us and beat us down. It's time we break away from that because one is our master, even Jesus Christ.